Uh, good morning, and thank you, Kathy, for a great introduction to the foundation. Kathy's our executive director, and we're so proud to have her with us. Um, we're, we really would like to start this part of the program talking about uh, the need for medical research and the need for funding for research. Um, as you know, the foundation itself has a, a robust um, has a robust uh, peer-reviewed um, medical research program where we have a call out now for uh, applications that are coming in. And we've funded over $7 million in research grants over the years that the foundation has been in existence. Um, we are now, we've been calling upon Congress and we've been calling upon the Department of Defense to increase funding for mesothelioma. Uh, as many of you are aware, um, uh, asbestos is, uh, was just used rampantly within the military and about 30% of our patients are actually military vets. So we really feel the Department of Defense has an obligation to fund mesothelioma. Uh, and we're looking for more research dollars. And every year we get a chance and an opportunity uh, to speak before the uh, to Appropriations Committee to present the case for the need for this increased funding for uh, mesothelioma. Uh, I'm just waiting for some of my slides to uh, show up. <laughs> but I just will just keep speaking off the cuff while I'm waiting for them to come. Uh, many of the patients that are here today, um, I just want to really recognize the patients that are here because so many of you have participated in research. Um, many of you have been uh, treated at the, some of the premier institutions where you've donated your blood, you've donated your tissue, you've signed consent forms to be on, um, on um, chemotherapy trials, surgery trials, and you're helping your fellow patients by participating in all these uh, different research activities. And we're so proud to have you with us, and we're here to partner with you to fund, to fund a cure, to find a cure, and to try to extend lives and to save lives. So we're all in this together, and thank you again for being with us uh, and to help us to achieve these goals. Um, this is live. Um, does someone have the slides for me, please? Thank you. I'm sorry? Tell a, oh, me? Tell a joke? You know I'm very serious, Rich. <laughs> and I never tell tales out of school either. <laughs> uh, you know something? Well, you know, I'm going to take care of a little bit of housekeeping while I'm here as well. Uh, Glenara Bates is here, and Toby Bressler, could you please raise your hands? Okay. Uh, Toby is a nurse, and uh, Glenara is a social worker. They're here with institutional approved IRB forms. Uh, they're going to be speaking to doctors and to patients. Uh, they're doing some surveys. Um, you know, there's really a, just a dearth of information in terms of quality of life, and and really a little bit, uh, and not much is known about the lives of mesothelioma patients, and about who participates in research and why you participate in research. So they'll be meeting with many of you here, and we hope that everybody would be willing to participate in this clinical trial uh, and to fill out the surveys. And they'll be explaining a little bit more about that later. Uh, also, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Guardino, who's here from the University of Hawaii. And, uh, we have some consent forms from the University of Hawaii, and what we're particularly interested in are patients who've had multiple cancers, uh, patients who've had mesothelioma in their families, uh, skin cancers. Uh, again, we have uh, IRB-approved consent forms for this population, and we'll be drawing blood um, in the premises. I have uh, Eleanor Erickson, and I have uh, Lisa Hyde Barrett with us. Uh, they're two nurses from a uh, critical care unit, so you know they're excellent at doing bloods. And they're here to uh, draw blood at some time uh, during the day, uh, in the, during this afternoon, and we'll get a little more information about that. Lisa and Ellie, would you like to raise your hand so they know who you are and where you are? Okay. And they'll also have the consent forms with them, and uh, the blood draws will be taking place in our break room during the afternoon session.
I think this is it. <laughs> ah, wonderful. Here we go. Uh, so what we wanted to talk a little bit about was the peer-reviewed cancer research program, uh, the vision and mission of this program. Uh, I was actually asked to present these slides because uh, our representative was not able to be with us today to talk about the program. But the vision of this mission is to improve the quality of life by decreasing the impact of cancer on service members, their families, and the American public. And this, again, this goes back to uh, over 30% of those affected by mesothelioma are vets. Uh, the mission is to foster the next generation of cancer research by providing new and early career investigators opportunities to excel in, uh, in uh, groundbreaking cutting edge research for prevention, detection, and treatment of cancer. Uh, in the fiscal year 2008, mesothelioma was added as a research topic for funding under the peer-reviewed medical research program. Uh, the investment of that year was a little over $1 million. Uh, fiscal year 9 to 10, mesothelioma continued as a research project, investments of over $5 million. So you can see we've made some progress and we're do what we are getting some more money for funding of the disease. In the fiscal year 2011, mesothelioma was added as a research target uh, to the uh, uh, peer-reviewed uh, cancer research program with an investment, again, of over a million dollars. Uh, the total funding for mesothelioma research has been a little bit over $8 million. We look at congressional appropriations. We saw that $47 million has been uh, awarded to all the various cancers, and mesothelioma has been listed as a cancer that uh, is worthy of being funded. Uh, there's been 115 awards to these uh, different cancers. And this is a slide that just shows a little bit about some of the mesothelioma projects that have been funded. And I'd like to point out that there are 12 programs funded. And out of these 12, six of these uh, uh, investigators have been funded in the past by the Mesothelioma Applied Research uh, Program for our grant reviews program. So in other words, what we have done is we provided what we call some of the seed money to get these labs moving in mesothelioma research to provide some of the groundwork for some of these bigger grants. And our investigators have gone on to receive uh, more funding and to, to move forward with uh, some of the research that started with the foundation. Uh, so we're very proud to be affiliated with this group. Uh, you'll recognize many of these names because these are people that also have served on our scientific advisory board. Uh, there are also people that serve as peer reviewers for our scientific grants program. Uh, there are physicians, there are scientists, there are people who are near and dear to our hearts and the hearts of the patients in this community. So, uh, we do want to thank the government for the funding, but we also want to say it's not enough. And that's why we ask our patients and our advocates and our community members to go to Congress and to ask for more money and to make mesothelioma a, a, a more directed item for, uh, for funding because we really need to move, this, uh, move the science of this disease further. And it's only going to be with your help, your voices, and the collection of everybody in this room that's going to continue to, uh, to, to make some progress. I had the opportunity uh, for the past four years to speak before the Senate Appropriations Committee uh, and to, 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 you know, to testify about the need for mesothelioma research. And this year, Tom Schakowsky, who's not with us, asked me to share his, uh, his story. Uh, Tom was a Navy vet. Uh, he served in what he called uh, an asbestos cocoon in his ship. Exposed to asbestos then, he developed pleural mesothelioma. Uh, Tom is somebody who's been through an extra pleural luminectomy, and he's had numerous chemotherapy, uh, numerous, uh, chemotherapy sessions. And Tom is not with us today because he's back in the battle again, getting more chemotherapy. So it's on behalf of patients like Tom and behalf of the patients in this room that we go and we speak before this committee, and we, we really want them to put a face and a name to the disease. Uh, I think what happens is, you know, when you think about mesothelioma, um, and you look at all the ads that are on TV and on the radio and in newsprint, people are under the misconception that this is a disease that's so common. And they don't realize that there's only 3,500 cases a year in the United States. So it's very hard to keep scientists involved in research because they're researching such a small disease. Uh, pharmaceutical companies do not find it to be an attractive target because even with an approved drug, 
they're not going to make a fortune because there's not that many people that are going to be able to get the, uh, get the treatment. So we need to rely on large bodies to fund this disease. We can't rely on pharmaceutical companies. We ask you to help us with our funding. But we really need the government to step up to the plate um, to make up for the damages that have been done to, to the American citizens and to help us find a cure and to increase dollars for research funding. So yesterday you were on the Hill. You're all going to be going back home. Continue with the work. Work with Jessica. She'll point you in the direction of who should be called. She'll, she'll even give you exactly what needs to be said, what to ask for, and let's all of us be on the same page asking for more research funding. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to now introduce Julie Gundelak. Uh, Julie is known to so many in this community. Julie is a peritoneal mesothelioma patient. She's an advocate. She's a close friend of the foundation. And Julie has had uh, the distinct honor of serving as a peer reviewer for, the, uh, for some of the uh, medical research that's going on. So she has represented you in terms of looking at some of these research protocols and giving input from a patient perspective. Julie, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I don't have slides. Uh, you can thank me for that later. Uh, first, I want to correct Mary because I, I don't consider myself a patient. I consider myself a survivor. Uh, Time will tell, but I was diagnosed in uh, August of 06, which means I'm coming up on six years uh, as a survivor, and I, I really owe most days of that six years to the Miso Foundation. So thank you to the foundation. <laughs> and the staff and the attorneys and everybody that's here, we couldn't do it without you. So I served on the CDMRP twice. CDMRP, again, is Congressionally Directed Medical Research Programs. There is a brochure in your bags, if you haven't seen it, it kind of looks like this, that could probably give you far more information than I could. But I'm just gonna kind of tell you about my experience. I've served twice. The first time uh, I was contacted, I was nominated and referred by the foundation, and then contacted by the committee with the DOD, and you have to fill out an application and everything like this. The first time they sent us here to DC, they brought us here to DC, I guess, and we came in person. We read research proposals ahead of time, uh, which I'm telling you as a lay person is extremely intimidating and difficult because it's all written in scientific language. If anybody has ever sat through one of the in-depth research presentations here at the foundation as a layperson, you, you know that it's not a language, perhaps, that you speak. But uh, they're written in several layers, and there's a detailed layer, and then there's an abstract, and, and then there's kind of a lay version. So you kind of wade your way through that, and what they're really looking for from us as patients is how realistic it seems. I know that the first time I served with Rich Mosca here, I think we were both pretty intimidated by the whole process. But what it boils down to is they want to hear what, what we have to say. They really do. And, and saying things like, you know, I really feel like that is an unrealistic protocol because I know what I've been through and I can't imagine anybody going through that. I think it's virtually impossible. You know, they need to hear that. You know, uh, I know that we're all here for the same end of beating this disease, but we're coming at it from different directions. And we all need to work together to kind of really flesh out what's, what's possible and what's practical. So we sat through two, maybe 10 hour days of, of listening to these things, but it really, I think, elevated the conversation between us and the researchers. And these are not necessarily all things that are going to trial right now. These are, this is cellular research, this is target-based research, and 
you know, we got to start at the very beginning. And like Mary said, the foundation is good at offering seed money to get these things rolling. And without that, they wouldn't even make it to that level of, of research. So we just got to keep, keep kind of funding these things. So the second time I did it, it's now done online, which I found to be more challenging, quite frankly, because you don't have that face-to-face -face kind of interaction. And it was the same protocol. You apply, you send in your W-2 because you get paid an honorarium per each review that you do. And we kind of had an online discussion about these things. One thing that I found to be valuable is there's X amount of money per year that they're going to give to research in various cancers. It's not just mesothelioma applying for this money. And what it boils down to is they're not necessarily going to give 20 grants. If they don't find 20 that are appropriate and valid, they'll give 10 grants. So it's really important to get our best research forward in front of Congress so we can get as, as large of a piece of that pie as we can possibly get. Because like Mary said, 30% of mesothelioma cases can be linked to the military. And up until a few years ago, the DOD gave nothing to help support mesothelioma research. They have millions and millions and millions of dollars every year that they use for what they consider military-related diseases. Uh, and if you think about anything that's a military-related disease, it's really just about anything, because all that matters is it affects somebody in the military. And you have everything from Agent Orange poisoning to alcoholism to cancers, I mean, diabetes. As I go to these panels, they're, they're touching on everything. So there's a lot of competition out there for these grants. So we really got to push that. So when you read these uh, Aramaic, uh, applications, I think. Uh, a job is for the patient is to really kind of focus on the strengths and weaknesses of, of each application. If you are someone who enjoys research, is medically minded like that, I encourage you to look into it because I believe they're always looking for more people to kind of participate. You will be handheld through the process by the people at the, uh, at the DOD. And it's really, really rewarding in a way to see that there's something being done. I, I think for us, that's one of the things that, that gives me the most hope, is when I was diagnosed, I was told to put my affairs in order and, and everybody kind of washed their hands of me on a local level. And then I found the Miso Foundation, where I found there was hope, but to realize that even outside of here, if we reach out in various ways, there are other ways we can get help. I mean, we certainly couldn't do it without, without the foundation, but the foundation can't do it alone. We can't continue to pick our own pockets because those are limited resources. And I'm here to tell you, if anybody's got money, it's the government. So we want help from them because on a level, they, uh, they're contributing to this disease. As long as asbestos is not illegal in the United States, they're contributing to this disease. So they should take some responsibility and help us fund a cure for this. Uh, I've greatly appreciated the opportunity to serve. And it's just good to remember you know, some people can speak in public, some people can fundraise, and some people can do this. Don't look at, at the arms of, of what we do here and think, oh, well, I could never get up and speak, so I, I don't have anything to offer. Or I don't know how to fundraise, so I don't have anything to offer. This is another area where you can contribute. Take this information. Give it to your senators, to your congressmen, to your representatives, and let them know that we want more money for research. This is where we have our power. 
you got to turn your anger into power and your hurt into power because you got to turn it around, otherwise you don't stand a chance. So join me in this and uh, go home and make a few phone calls. Thanks. <laughs>